Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. Capitalism, go! This week's episode sponsor is our Amazon Associates link. Yeah, basically how it works. They really want us to get you to shop at Amazon, so they're willing to give us a kickback of all the shit you buy from them because, you know, we're amazing advertisers and get you to buy shit you don't want. But don't. Don't buy something you don't want. Buy, go, buy something you want. Buy something you want and you're intending on already purchasing. So if you're going to be going to Amazon, click through our link. It gives us a little bit of money, takes that away from Amazon, and it kind of fucks them in this whole scheme because you're not spending more money. So don't spend more money, just what you already intended to. They'll get you to spend more money while you're on the site anyway. It's so true. Free shipping. <laughs> it, makes, it sounds like we actually are paid by them, but we're not. It, you, in a weird way we are but yeah they pay us if you buy if you buy things them. yeah if you are looking for something to buy through them just because you want to support the show i recommend the simply gum variety pack it's pretty good i've only had one of them i really like the ginger gum i'm a huge fan of simple gums my favorite is ginger and then clove they don't have clove but they have awesome other flavors like cinnamon mint maple coffee you know you get the idea it's really awesome gum there's only six ingredients so you don't have to be worried about any of that shit fennel one sounds awesome too i'm not a huge fennel fan so yeah 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 but you are but i'm a huge ginger fan and mm, it, like ginger it's oil. gingery like if you like ginger it, that shit is perfect for you so check it out if you're interested if not cool whatevs <laughs> god we sound like we're sellouts which site podcast.com click on the amazon link This is episode 135. Yeah, we have Eric McDavid on. I, I love this episode. We talk to Eric. Uh, if you don't know much about his case, we go into it a little bit. It's a fucking travesty as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just super glad that he's out of prison. Just listen and support him. This week, we don't have a listener shout out. If you'd like to do a shout out, just go to whichsidepodcast.com. Click on the donate tab. And you can find out ways that you can shout out something on our podcast. What news and events do we have going on this week, Jordan? Well, ironically, this lines up perfectly. <laughs> uh, it's June 11th, uh, International Solidarity with Long-Term Anarchist Prisoners. So go out, do something. If you can't find an event, you can always host an event. Or you just write prisoners. Prisoners totally need your support. And you need your love. So write them. That's one of the things we talk about with Eric. He, he even says in, in the interview... Writing a prisoner, there's no way of actually telling you how much it means to them. Um, it's undescribable. Also, it's the Resistance Ecology Conference is coming up. So go check that out. Eric Walsh will be there too. So you can say hi to him. Uh, check out the SAC prisoner support table and check out all the awesome things that are let going him, on there. Let, and let him know you heard him on Which Side Podcast. For the slingshot this week, on June 10th, 1929. There was an insurrection of workers in Caracas, Venezuela, against dictator Gomez. Here we are talking about syndicalism when we go into syndicalism on the show. You'll know what Jordan is talking about if you listen to the whole episode because we go into syndicalism. So it's a good one. I hope you enjoy it. So how are you doing? Good. Good. Yeah. How's your, how's your day gone so far? Very nice, actually. Do, do you have it, any uh, awesome weekend plans? No, I got those kind of taken care of earlier in the week. For real, for real, it's just kind of a relaxing weekend before going up to Portland next weekend. What the, are you doing up in Portland? The, the resistance ecology oh. thing? Oh, yep. Yeah. Called it. <laughs> I should have known that, but yeah, no, it's all right. There's no shoulds. <laughs> so, what are you doing at the Resistance Ecology? Are you speaking up there or just attending? No, we're we've got a 
me and SAC Prisoner Support have, we're doing some tabling up there, and also we have a, whatever it is when you're called, when you're like in front of people and talking, that type of thing. Speaking? Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> how, how is it like uh, being like thrust in front of everyone now, now that you're out, kind of like uh, almost a poster child? Ugh. Uh, <laughs> I try I try and delineate from that type of like relationship with anyone or anything for real for real. Um it's kinda weird. I've like talked about this with a couple of folks and it's just kinda like I've like I grew up uh, with red hair. Mm-hmm. My my like like it's 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 been fading since my twenties, but yeah, like really red hair when I was young. And so like for me, I just kind of like got used to standing out a little bit mm-hmm. in that way. And so I just kind of like relate to it as that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It totally makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, basically, I guess uh, if you wanted to kind of explain for our listeners who aren't familiar with your case and a little bit about your history. All right. Let's see. Um, where to start? Okay, so the case, um, I got arrested in, on January 13th of 2006, um, at, uh, in, here in Auburn, um, and charged with Conspiracy to utilize explosives against government property and interstate commerce. Um, with their primary evidence of like being around uh, what many would consider um, a provocateur um, and basically like and agent of the FBI creating a situation to where those charges could be brought against me. So, yeah, it was a Friday the 13th and a full moon. (laughs) So the reason I left the house is still beyond me. Um, (laughs) But I don't mind them too much anymore. They're a little bit intense, but yeah. Um, Let's see. So got wrapped up then, did 28 months in isolation overall in Sac County Prison Jail. Um, and also there's my website that people can check out. It's supporteric.org, I believe. And, and that website has literally everything from the very first motions and, and indictment all the way through the end to the transcripts of the court proceedings um, this last January when I was released. So, so yeah, over that 28 months, um, I took my case to trial with an entrapment defense, um, lost after 10 days of trial in September of 07 and was sentenced in May of 08 to just short of 20 years uh, in federal prison. Um, How I was able to get out recently, like six months ago, almost to the day, um, was, so like I went through the regular procedures of doing a direct appeal to the circuit where you get a three, three judge panel. And when I got my three judge panel, it was the most conservative judge in the entire 127 judges pool that they pull from. And my trial judge's best friend from law school. And then once you, once you get the majority, it doesn't matter. They tried to make it look nice for the third one, which, um, who was actually a decent 
judge uh, so far as they can be decent. <laughs> um, but yeah, once they have a majority, then it's just kind of done with. So they denied my appeal at the circuit level. Um, and then, of course, they denied it at the Supreme Court. Went on to file a habeas corpus petition, which is like a last ditch effort for anyone in the legal realm. Was able to utilize um, Freedom of Information Act reports um, through um, Sacramento Prisoner Support. I had done extensive uh, like requests for me for those, those FOIA, FOIA documents and within them they were able to find documents that hadn't been provided during trial as they should have because like in trial you're supposed to get like discovery from the government and they're supposed to give you everything that they're going to use against you for the trial so that their 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 idea or, or what they put forth is that everyone has the same amount of information to go from to to provide for the jury. So when we got like and it, it was it was really interesting the way <laughs> the FOIA developments went. So my lawyer, as soon as I went to trial, he did a, his own FOIA request for me, and they gave a return. Um, notice saying that they don't have any documents pertaining to me <laughs> uh, despite already giving him like 2,000 pages worth of documents that they were going to um, use during trial and so like yeah that's just pretty much classic um, so there was another one made like right after my sentencing in 08 and that's when we started seeing things that weren't really uh, in line with what they they had been the show that they've been giving us. Um, I, th I believe there was like on top of the two thousand pages that I received for trial via discovery, there was an additional couple of thousand pages, like twenty four thousand. 2,400 pages. Um, did I say 20,000? I said uh, 2,000. 2,000 and an additional 2,000 pages. And there's still like 800 more that they say exist, but they won't provide. Um, hmm. And so like in digging through those new documents, my support team, support crew, were able to look at what those documents were pointing at because they they made reference to other documents that weren't provided within the FOIA. And so we utilized that as uh, Brady issues. And it's a, I think it's a 2001 case, United States versus Brady, to where it just basically says that the government's got to give you all the documents that are pertaining to your case, whether or not they say they have them or not so that you can use them in your defense. Um, and so that's kind of like we brought that up in front of it because it's got to go to a magistrate first for your habeas, for them to look at it. And then this magistrate had actually been in the uh, U.S. prosecuting attorney, the USA's, U.S. attorney's office, back when I was being uh, indicted and, and tried. And so he got all bent out of shape in what our motions were saying about the office back then. And so he was like taking it personal that if that actually happened, then it was kind of like shedding light on him and or, or reflected back on him. Mm -hmm. And so the United States attorney that, that was handling my habeas, um, surprised the heck out of me because uh, he contacted, after he read the motions, he contacted uh, one of my lawyers down in the Bay, um, Mark Vermillion, and 
was like, so these documents that you say that you're supposed to have, um, what do you want to do? Because you were supposed to have them. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. And so Mark's just like, no, actually, what do you want to do? <laughs> so he just kind of threw it back in his court and he's like, okay, let me talk to my superiors and we'll see what we can do. Um, so yeah. And then that was like the, the beginning of the end right there. And then they kind of just started working on like what they could possibly put together that wouldn't totally freak the judge out. Um, and see me still getting out. So, yeah. And then it just all ended up falling in together. And of, and of course, I mean, there's, there's all the stipulations and everything. And like, I had to plead to a uh, general conspiracy, which has a limit of five years of time served. And so, yeah. And then it just came down to getting the judge to agree to it which was a little tricky. Um, on the 8th of January, because we had everything lined out, and there's one thing that judges don't really like to do is like have decisions made for them. <laughs> they get really particular when they feel like they don't have an avenue to go down that is like uniquely their own. So, or like that they can't like assert their power to to move through move things through so and like the eighth it was crazy because i mean we we had everything all signed and everything done wrapped up and we started going down this path and for about half hour the judge is just grilling the u.s attorney's office and me and mark and ben are just standing there just kind of listening and not having to say i don't think mark said more than like five words to that first half hour and then the judge called a recess and for like 15 minutes so i went back into the side cell it's in the other in the hallway and i was chatting it up out there but like we had no idea what the judge was going to do because he had basically like three different options he could do he could recognize the motion and then through that either like totally drop the charges he could and let me go which of course he's not going to do um he could order a new trial with the evidence that had been withheld or he could have went down the path that we'd already laid out for him and with like the deal that we came up with. Um, yeah. And he, when we came back from recess, he, he was still seesawing he, and he on around um, for at least another 20 minutes. And then finally came to begrudgingly, allow like the process that the u.s attorney's office and my lawyers had had come up with and then shortly thereafter like i went back over to sac county and was maybe there for like an hour bouncing up and down the cell with my celly <laughs> and then they called me out and took me back over to the uh federal building and then let me out through there how surreal was that that was more than surreal because i'd been down like almost nine years five days short of nine years on that day fucking hell <laughs> <laughs> and your your partner came out and and picked you up too right and your and your folks or was it am i mistaken no yeah my partner at the time was there, and my sister, and my both my parents were there. Yeah, it was awesome. Way cool. How how was your family support during the whole ordeal? 
it was awesome. I mean, for real, for real. I mean, they, um, luckily, like, they had, a, they had, like, funds to be able to help out with the lawyer stuff with Mark Reichold for the, during the trial. Um, and, like, they'd come and see me, like, once a week when I was at county. Um, after that, when I got sent to Victorville and then Terminal Island after that, um, they'd come and see me once a month. So, yeah, it was really good. I, how important do you feel it is for um, like prisoners to have that kind of support structure? So are you talking about specifically the support structure from their family or just from from community or from all of it or kind of from all of it. I mean, cause I mean, family doesn't have to be blood. I mean, family mm-hmm. can be community and everything else. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's fundamental to like waking up in the morning for real, for real. I mean, it's like the only way that like I was able to survive as I have, um, through, through those nine years was like, because I knew that, there was a community out there that that did support me wholeheartedly and and yeah like the la- the letters that i was getting folks just sending in books on random um yeah no I mean, it was just yeah there 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 is no words to like try and express like how important that is for for folks that are on the inside you know, it's one of the things we're we're always pushing our listeners to do is, is try to support prisoners, write letters, do do whatever you can. And I'll be the first one to say I don't do enough. Uh, I mean, I I don't I think most people feel they probably don't do enough. But, um, I, you know, talking to people as soon as they're out and, and you know, it everyone says basically just what you're saying that, you know, you almost can't describe how important it really is. Mm-hmm. No, it's totally valid. And um, so... How would you explain when when someone gets out, what's like the best way to help support them once they're out? I know it's probably different for each person, but um, mm-hmm. I think that's like a topic that a lot of people, they focus on people when they're inside, but they don't really yeah. think about what happens once they get out. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it, it really is like, like totally uh, subjective because, I mean, there's some people like don't have like, really good skills with like dealing with bureaucracies Mm -hmm. and so like having to like deal with the the bullshit that comes around with like getting into school or dealing with the bureaucracy of like um, getting a driver's license or sign up for food stamps or or dealing with like having to get a job or like some of those basic necessities are really like challenging for especially like right when you get out because you're just bombarded by this surreal amount of stimulus um as to compared to being in and i could only imagine i mean for myself i was only in for less than a year but i was like just going outside and going swimming and going for a hike in the mountains like that was surreal for me so yeah no definitely totally i mean i just went up to this trail up in the mountains yesterday with with Petey. Mm-hmm. um oh he says hi by the way <laughs> and um and so yeah i mean just putting myself in like different i don't know lack of better terms but like putting myself in like different bubbles to kind of, to kind of like alleviate like the stresses of all the stimulus that come with being around all this. I'm like, I'm in front of a coffee shop right now and it's still surreal. For sure. Um, so but like, yeah. Like what, what was it like, like going up in the mountains for the first time or, or going for a swim the first time? Oh, it's like going home. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Was, was there no anything question. that like shocked you, like when you got out, um, as far as like how much it meant to you that you missed it? Maybe the one thing that always like that like I missed the most, and the one thing that still like stands out 
the most is just like being over, being like around a loved one or or family or community and like just reaching out and like touching their arm while I'm talking or like leaning up against them while we're talking or just like that kind of contact. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm like uber tactile person. And so like touch is like my, my foundation. And so, yeah, so that, that part, like, best part about it because like being in prison like everyone has their space Mm -hmm. and everyone has their things in a certain in a certain in a certain space and so it's just like really the really clear and defined boundaries that are just heavily set and so not having that around is just ridiculously beautiful so what, what are like the, the like, uh, differences you see in the radical community, like the, the, the vegan anarchist community from the, the time you went in until the time you got out? Curious. Um, good question. There's like, so when I went in, there was like all of that energy that was just starting to like really wane and fade out with the oh, what do they call it? Like conference hopping or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, That part was just starting to die out. And like now it feels like things are a lot broader and they've gained more depth. Like in like what, what people are like getting into and it's, it's gotten a lot smaller, which is good. And so far as like people's focus, it's not like, splayed out it doesn't feel splayed out all over the place it feels a lot more like people are really for real for real, like staying home and like dealing with the issues that are within their communities in a lot more hands-on way yeah i could t- i could see that um do you, do you kind of mean like in, in some ways they're not just like overall saying fuck capitalism it's more like getting into the nitty-gritty in their own communities of how to combat you know like capitalism and everything else yeah, and, and, and like, insofar as, like, how capitalism and, like, the power over structures are being manifested in their, how they're, how they're taking material basis within their communities, they're addressing mm-hmm. that and not just, like, spread so thin. All, they're, people aren't, or the community is not spread so thin over, like, this general concept. Yeah, I mean, I really thought about it. Like, like um... Like for me, I've I've always just kind of uh, lamented the the height of the late '90s animal rights movement, <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, and I don't think we'll ever get that back exactly. But um, it's just you know how things evolve and change. Yeah, no, exactly, and, and like it's yeah, and I don't I don't know if you'd want that back because I mean the situations change too, mm-hmm. and so like that that energy is still there it feels like and that that there's still that potential but there's just yeah there's there's definitely been a shift with that i could see that so what 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 was your origin like what brought you to to being radical like what radicalized you okay you ready so this one's a little bit long (laughs) 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 so like like at the gate so like I was framing houses up in in the Central Valley, um, actually up in the hills when September 11th happened, mm-hmm. and I was driving to work, and that and I was like listening to the to this regular radio station, and it came on that the planes had hit the buildings and this uh, DJ was just totally discombobulated. He was so out of his like comfort zone that he actually talked, started talking like for real, for real about like, like he was, he, like his confusion and just kind of like, I don't, I don't know what to do what he was saying. And, and like, I don't, because this, these, 
this medium and, the, and like this radio station is not set up from for us to provide this type of information because we're here basically as a distraction to make it easy for you to get to work in the morning. And so like that, that stuff didn't sink in all the way for me um, at the gate, but it just kind of like sifted in down to the bottom. And there was like a lot of questions in my mind that started to arise around like what in the devil would cause someone or a group of people to think that doing those types of actions would be okay to do. I mean, how, what kind of frame of reference do you need to have in order for those to be like viable options to use? And so like, there was like a lot of like underlying questions that were, that had been, that were like building up within me around that. And so like, I started like looking into like, um, a little bit of government stuff and like my folks gave me, um, Michael Moore's book, Dude, Where's My Country, which kind of like had a bunch of history in it and also like the hypocrisies that happen within like bureaucracy and government to where, I mean, it's just like, oh, what's the word when like payoffs and everything mm -hmm. like that and misallocated funds, how, whatever terms they like to use for that. Um, and so there was like this coming to where I was like looking at the history that I've been provided like through school and then coming across this new information which was in direct contradiction to that history that I had been given and so like I felt like this huge betrayal between this like a gr unstated agreement or like unconscious agreement that I'd had with like, Oh, okay. The government's the government. They're doing their thing. They're the professionals that know how to do this. And so they should know how to do it in the best and healthiest way possible. And so, and so far as like me uh, just voting and everything, they're the ones that are doing everything. And so they know how to do it. I don't have to do anything more than that because they wouldn't be there if they weren't trusted to be there. And mm -hmm. so, like, as that began to procure more and more, like, I got um, into the anti-war movement uh, and went to my first uh, anti-war march. Oh, I hate Harleys. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was down in the Bay Area on October 25th of either 01 or 02. It was either that same year or the year after. And, uh, and like, that was my first experience with like the anti-war movement. Um, and it was just like a quarter of a million people marching down the street with one intent. And it was for real, for real, it was fucking mind blowing because like with everyone there with one intent and everyone there was like looking after each other. You got food, you got water, do you need some tobacco? Are you cool? Or do you need to talk? You, try, you look like you're fucking having a hard time. Do you want to talk about this? And, and so, like, that triggered at, like, some some really big, like, community, like, ideals that, that I'd experienced when I was a kid, which, like, was, like, tangible for me and just, like, really awesome. And so I was like, oh, gosh, I want to keep this going. I want to do whatever I can to, like, help this out and maintain this type of like community situation. Cause it was the only type of community situation that felt like it had like shades of authenticity in it. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of a big guy. I was like two fifteen, six foot. I just got done doing carpentry for like two and a half years. And I just got back to school. Um, so I was like, all right, maybe I'll help out with like security or something. And, like, went and did a whole bunch of, like, de-escalation trainings, um, nonviolent training, civil disobedience trainings, more and more de-escalation trainings. And even got so far as, like, doing the train the trainer stuff and de-escalation trainings. Um, and so, like, was a part of the de-escalation crews that helped out during the marches in the Bay um, where 
there was like wherever there was like individuals that were like too hyped up hyped up on drugs or alcohol or whatever we'd go in there and like apparently i was the only one that took myself took the took the thing like authentically and seriously because whenever like this group of like six folks and i would like go and like talk to this person everyone else would leave except for me and i'd be left to like to calm the person down and like pull them aside and hear their story and make sure they were heard and then like kind of see what what they wanted to do and where they wanted to go after that and within it so that was like a huge thing and then like later on after like a few of the marches I was kind of like okay well they're still doing the bombings and they're still doing the wars so I wonder what in the devil so I took a little bit of a step back and just start participated in the marches and then like one of the times I was walking around the tables and this person walks up to me with like this Maoist paper and I think I had I had one of the um the answer anti-war uh t-shirts on and they came up and they're like hey you want a paper i was like yeah sure because i was like reading everything back then just trying to soak everything up and then they made a comment about my shirt they're like oh you know answer is just like some leninist vanguard right and like i blew it off and i was like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just a fucking cool shirt that's what, I, that's what i'm wearing it's just yada 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 but later on i was like god damn, for real? Answer has like this vanguard behind it. They're not really just people that are act, acting now to stop war and, and racism. And so like, I felt like that same type of betrayal that I'd felt with like the government because I would saw them portraying one thing and not like overtly expressing like where they were moving from if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, well, fuck this. I ain't going to the Bay to do these fucking answer things no more because they're just fucking trying to push their own political agenda. And for these unstated, like with, with these unstated premises. So I like really reeled it back in just did like, uh, I was going to junior college out here at the time. Um, like students, Students for Peace or something like that. And like one of the small anti-war groups up in the hills, I was helping them out. Um, and then I was, it was at, at a students, students for Peace or Students for Nonviolence or something like that. Uh, one of their meetings, I was sitting there and there's this person next to me who's like got this like six inch stack of paper and they're just like offset, like, about 30, 30 pages each just offset. And he was taking them and like stapling them in the middle and then folding them down the middle where the staple was and then setting them off to the side into like little booklets. And I was like, what in the devil? Where the fuck did he print all that shit out from? <laughs> and I like looked at, looked, at the, looked at the front cover and it's got this like androgynous um, like face with like these metallic dreads and it said species trader on it. And I was like, species trader? How in the fuck do you be a trader, trader to your own species? And so I'm spinning on that for a second. And I was like, hey, you mind if I look at that? And he's just like, yeah, here, you can have it. And I was like, all right, cool. And I just threw it in my bag for a coffee shop later on or whatever. But when I like got into it, it was like my first like introduction to like authentic social critique uh, via like uh, the like anarchist viewpoint. And so like while I was reading it, it was just kind of like it, I could feel that like not only was there like a critique of like the situation and the culture, but there was also a critique of the critique. They were, they were like questioning why they were looking at things the way they were. And so that was like the most authentic political critique or like political analysis that I'd found at the time. And so with that, I just, then I just started running with it because it felt authentic. It felt like it was real and they weren't trying to, to hide anything within their writings, but just exploring 
what they were talking about and how they were talking about it at the same time. It, it's really funny you brought up Species Trader because I actually have the very first Species Trader sitting in front of me right now. <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> Winter 2001. Uh, nice. Uh, that's awesome. So from there, is that kind of like what got you interested in like like veganism and everything else? That kind of like it snowballed from there. Yeah, it just kind of like snowballed. The vegan thing was just kind of like I I've been like exploring those ideas. Like that was in the spring, so I'd explore those ideas like over the summer, and was reading a shit ton. And then like in the fall, there was like some event where they did a bunch of tabling, um, like in the quad, at the JC, and. I'm walking by this table and it's got like these little buttons and like I was big into buttons at the time. Um, and, but it's, it's written in like the old, um, remember the old got milk mm -hmm. with like the, mm -hmm. the, the back, the black background with the white block letters. Mm -hmm. It's got that format, but it said got pus. And I was mm -hmm. like, God, pus. <laughs> not pus. How did that, and so I asked the person behind the table, I was like, what's, what's up with this? And they were just like, yeah, hook up a, um, a, like a metal sucking machine to your nipple for like longer than 10 minutes and see what happens to your nipple. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so that one sunk home pretty quick. Um, and so like I dropped milk right away and then like began to like, analyze and look at like the process process that meats and dairy and fish and everything else went through within this culture. And so like it was, I, I started dropping everything off after that. And then six months later I was vegan. It's interesting. You, you went about it like backwards the way most people, most people will stop meat first and then stop dairy. Yeah. Yeah, no, oh yeah, no. Once I saw that, dairy was gone. And then beef, <laughs> beef was next. Well, well, it was funny, like, listening to, like, your whole origin story, I, I never thought I would have to thank Michael Moore for radicalizing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't radicalize anybody. He helped give me a little bit of a window. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, you were also talking about, like, the, those large demos and um, kind of how amazing they are for the first time and, you know, for giving people a sense of community, I really think that that's where those type of demos shine because it really is awe-inspiring of how communities can come together in those, those instances. No, definitely, yeah. Yeah. And it's that hands-on experience mm -hmm. that really, like, grabs. I think, um, like, my, my most in inspiring thing at one of those large demos, I think it was the DNC in 2000, um, and we were walking with the block and all of a sudden this, this really old guy, I'm poor at judging ages, mm -hmm. older than 70, um, yeah. most likely, comes walking up, pulls out a flag from his backpack, pokes a pole together. It's just says, no gods, no masters. Like, I'm with you guys. And we're like, <laughs> just blew my fucking mind. <laughs> like, <laughs> awesome. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sends shivers down my spine. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's got goosebumps. Yeah, it was, it was pretty fucking cool. <laughs> So you said like you really got like you were like trying to absorb everything and reading everything you get. Were you like reading like like the classic anarchists or what kind of things were you reading? No, yeah, I never like really got into like the classic stuff. It was like a lot of the stuff around like uh, Green Anarchy was still around at that time, mm -hmm. and so it was a lot more of like Luddite stuff. And yeah, yeah it was a lot a lot more around that type of like the use the ideas of like tools and like and like a lot of like really passionate stuff does cause i i really remember that too and like a lot of that primitivism really spoke to me but it never really stuck with me if that makes sense like do, do totally. you do you consider yourself like a primitivist like go down that route no like like i can see like how aspects of it mm-hmm are are like really like able to be utilized in, in numerous ways and so like i don't i'm kind of like i i i do like i can like identify myself as like a green anarchist but 
more so like within like the negative purview because I I, I have like fundamental issues with like cynicalism, mm-hmm. um, and so it's yeah, so it's more like not red as 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 it, as it's like green <laughs> and so yeah and so that part's kind of like there that that's funny um i don't know about jordan but like i usually if i'm talking to people i'll describe myself something along the lines of uh syndicalist with green tendencies mm-hmm. or something like that yeah mm. even though like I'm kind of like with you, like I'm not a hundred percent a syndicalist and I don't go on the full edge of like green anarchists either. Yeah. What color does red and green make? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it brown? <laughs> brown anarchist. <laughs> Better than yellow. <laughs> Touche. Uh, yeah, so I'm like trying to like lean away from like the adjectives and everything, but like, but yeah, I just can't do the red thing for some reason. What What's your biggest drawback to it, like to syndicalism? That it's so wound up in like materialism and like wound up in the type of even though it's like. Anti, oh, I don't know. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that one's just tricky because there's like all of this like unionist history that's wrapped up in it, mm-hmm. and so it's just kind of like there, there are some like base premises that go into like having a union orientation, like because it's originated within capitalism and like has come out through and manifested most throughout that and and like kind of like i get kind of like wrapped up in like the outcomes of everything i mean the ideals are kind of nice but when i look at like how it's manifested and how it's like how it's like in the moment right now and like looking at unionism like that's been is that even a word you, looking at unionism, um, like how it's like ended up manifesting, like ever since its big pulls, like back in the late eighteen hundreds and all the way up to like the thirties and forties. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and how it, what it, what did it end up like? And so there, there's got to be like it feels for me that there's got to be like some type of of issue with like the first step that was taken because how you take that first step determines where you go down the path and the way that you go down the path. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally does make sense. Um, I've always kind of, kind of viewed syndicalism as a, a stepping stone to educate workers on decentralization and the, the horrors of capitalism and how there's a possibility outside of it, not necessarily an ending point. No, I hear that. That's yeah. I mean, I, I've got this fucking. I'm a. I got this quality too, to where I can hold like both sides of the spectrum, <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of frustrating at times. But like at other times, it kind of like, I yeah. There there are issues that I see with it, and I but I can also see like where certain tools shouldn't be like not used. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, I mean, there, if there's opportunity and there's like an environment and a situation for like a tool to be utilized, then why wouldn't you use it to its utmost? Did, and so, yeah, I can see where like, where like cynicalists that where like they would have a foundation and be able to like integrate into those types of like environments a hell of a lot easier than like a Luddite for real for real. Have have you by chance had um, read the new uh, AK Price book Storm in My Heart? No, I haven't yet. Um, it's Helen Minkin. Uh, uh, she was the widow of Johann Most. Okay. And she like was kind of grew up in her twenties with um, Berkman and Emma Goldman. They like lived in the same commune together. And it's a 
it really is a scathing review of Berkman and, and Emma, basically, <laughs> and about how nice. there was a huge split in the anarchist movement at the time about, and they went one direction and they kind of went another direction. And mm. it just reminded me when you're talking about like the footsteps people take and then the direction that those go on. Hmm. So it's, it's pretty interesting read, um, especially if you like me and and Goldman never really sat right with you. Yeah, well, I mean, there's like, there's like, I don't know. Nobody's gonna sit like a hundred percent with everybody, <laughs> and so like, I mean, there's everybody's got. I don't know. There isn't anybody that's not somewhat of like a hypocrite for real, for real. I mean, oh, there, yeah. there's, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there are qualities within people that folks just ain't gonna agree with, no matter what, no matter where they come from. So. Yeah. So you you talked about like being part of like de-escalation training. Do you want to kind of talk about that a little bit? Like what goes into that? I wish I could. For real, for real. Um, a lot of it is just kind of like I've integrated it to such an extent now that I don't think about it anymore mm-hmm. because it's been like I don't know twelve years. Yeah, <laughs> for, sure. I've like for sure. Looked at anything like that, um, or like studied it hands on. So yeah, de-escalation is just like a lot about like um, reading bodies, body language, um, and like maintaining like uh, like vocal consistency. Looking at people on the eyes, helping them ground. Yeah. Okay. God, it's near you. Got to make make me want to look up, go back <laughs> over my notes now. <laughs> you also, you also kind of talked about like first being introduced to some radical ideas by like a Maoist. Like, did you did you follow through with that a little bit, or did you just kind of come to? anarchism naturally yeah no it was more naturally like i i read the papers and everything that they had out and all their all the that type of like propaganda and like there wasn't any like real pull for me because it felt like there was like a lot of like authoritarian authoritarianism and like a lot of power over stuff within it mm-hmm and that type of stuff had never kind of like been any type of like allure to me. I've always like been kind of shocked that people are actually drawn towards it. It seems like there's a huge uprising lately as well, especially here. At least in Utah. here, definitely. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Yeah, like they pretty much all the Black Lives Matter stuff has been organized by you know, malice. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can see why that happens. Cause I mean, they've, they've got the same type of, okay, we'll go there. They've got like the same type of <laughs> power structure that people are really used to. Yeah. It's just a different shade. And so they've, they're, they're huge on bureaucracy and they're huge on formality. And so they've got like this, like, rigid outlook that people can kind of go, Oh, okay. I don't have to change that much in order to like move into this frame of reference. That's why that makes sense. The the old college college Maoist turned liberal. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it works vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, It's true. I never thought about it that way. It does. Yeah. Sure does. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. Maoism just, even the name doesn't sit right with me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I've gotten over names. <laughs> it's, it's, it's religion is the... poison. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, he's got a point. Uh, this is what it does. <laughs> so, what was the first thing you ate when you got out of prison? Just throw it out a little bit. <laughs> I can't even remember for real for all i've eaten so much good food since i got out <laughs> that it just all blends together like they had this event at 
Station 40 and the mission in the bay to where they made like five or six like different like like plate like entrees or whatever masses amounts of food for like the event I think it was February 19th I went to there uh, which was like the first event that I went to since getting out and um yeah I mean they had like lasagna uh, a Thai dish a curry Indian dish this crazy dank ass like kale salad like and like vegan cheesecake and so yeah I mean that a plate with like all of that on it that was like the best <laughs> it was so overwhelming it just hit me You're, while you were in vegan cheese became good yeah that's been phenomenal <laughs> so what's yeah, like and and the ice cream oh yeah oh my gosh <laughs> the ice cream is seriously amazing so what's like the best thing that's changed in veganism since you've got gotten out yeah it's got to be the ice cream the ice cream <laughs> yeah no question the ice cream is definitely the best thing <laughs> there's a lot of good ice cream now yeah there is oh my it's God. amazing the coconut based stuff mm. yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know where that coconut stuff came from but whoever came up with that <laughs> capitalism <laughs> no that wasn't capitalism that was somebody <laughs> Thinking with their mouth, not <laughs> thinking with their wallet. That's just how it ended up. <laughs> so, like, what are you kind of focusing now? Are you focusing more on, um, like, yourself? Or are you trying to focus more on, you know, getting back involved in communities and, and, and yeah, and resistance? Uh, right now, I'm still on paper mm -hmm. and until at least January. And so... In all real like respects, my ass is still in prison, except for my physical butt. For sure. Mm -hmm. So that's where all that energy is right now. Did they give you like any super crazy restrictions that like a lot of people get? Like you can't talk to anyone who's vegan, straight edge, or things like that. No, there wasn't anything like that. I mean, like I had to go to counseling because I mean that was like a part of like the first like recommendation by the probation office. Yeah. I, I got that's pretty common sentenced. too, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I got that one too. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, but I mean, it was for them, it was like specifically, I mean, and they said it like during the, my sentencing, it was like, should go to counseling to figure out why he hates the government so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think mine was a little bit more like PTSD. It's like, just make sure you're okay. We don't want to be responsible. Yeah. Yeah. So you're lucky on that one. <laughs> yeah. So wh what's the conclusion of this counseling? Why why do you hate the government? So <laughs> we don't have the years <laughs> that it would take. <laughs> so th this is going to be like the first uh June 11th that you're you're out. So do you want to kind of like describe June 11th and what are your plans for it? All right, so June 11th is a day to support long-term anarchist and eco-prisoners um, where a lot of folks just get together and, like, grab a bite to eat and write letters and do benefits for folks that are on the inside. Um, and so this year, there's an event, an event down in Sacramento that I'm going to go and speak at with... Uh, Sacramento Prisoner Support, and one of my lawyers is coming up from the Bay to also speak about my case and, like, what happened and how it happened. So, yeah, that's basically it. It's a great great way of getting together with folks and, and supporting folks that are still on the inside. Way awesome. Well, how can people, you know, um, either get in contact with you or follow your, you know, what you're going to be up to or, you know, what happened? Um, probably the Sacramento Prisoner Support website would probably be the best way to do that. I think it's just Sacramento Prisoner Support dot org. Cool. Sweet. Well, we we yeah. uh, end every episode saying "fuck shit, damn." Would you mind saying it for us this week? Sure. Fuck shit, damn. <laughs> Sweet. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. 
It has. Thank you, guys. This week you heard Dream On, the Dave Clark Acoustic Edition. Right now you're listening to Cascade by Hyper. iTunes. Come on, let's be serious. 73% of you listen to this show through iTunes, which means that 73% of you right now could go rate and review us. So how about it? Give us some love. And if you already have, pick up your friend's phone, pick up your partner's phone, pick up any phone and show some love and for your friend. You know, if you do that, hashtag it with ghost review. That way we know how awesome you are. We also do all the little social things. Yeah, if you're not friends with us on social media, you should be our friend. You should follow us. You should like us. Whatever the social media equivalent of being our friend is, you should do it. We often say things on there that we don't talk about on the show. By often, that's pretty much every day. Yeah, and you know, if you have something going on in your neck of the woods, you know, put a shish to us on social. We'll push it out. We have no problem. Say hi to us. We'll say hi back. We're friendly. We don't bite. Unless you ask. And there's a safe word pre-established. Well, fuck shit damn, man. Fuck shit damn. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective. With web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn.